Good evening and welcome. This is the People's Platform. I thought of starting tonight's show um, with a poem that had a lot of resonance. Pity the Nation by Lawrence Ferlinghetti. Pity the nation whose people are sheep and whose shepherds mislead them. Pity the nation whose leaders are liars, whose sages are silenced. Pity the nation that raises not its voice except to praise conquerors and acclaim the bully as hero and aims to rule the world by force and by torture. Pity the nation whose breath is money and sleeps the sleep of the too well fed. Pity the nation, or oh, pity the people who allow their rights to erode and their freedoms to be washed away. My country, tears of thee, sweet land of liberty. Tonight's discussion will focus on the intersectionality of the legal, political and economic spheres. Um, to help me out with this discussion, we have two uh, experts. Dr. Sarat Raja Patirana, policy expert. Good evening and welcome, doctor. Thank you. Uh, we're also joined by Bhavani Fonseca, attorney at law, researcher at the Center for Policy Alternatives. Welcome to the show, Bhavani. Hi. My first question is to uh, Dr. Raja Patirana. Um, Sri Lanka's economy has been built on unsustainable debt. Frustrations are mounting with the unbearable cost of living. Um, there's public outrage and helplessness over a monumental government failure, uh, even to provide basic necessities. Um, Whilst it is in absolute dereliction of um, the state's duty towards the people, I'd like to focus my attention on um, the main financial mismanagement, uh, the major financial mismanagement that has been per perpetuated uh, and continues to be perpetuated um, by, by the government against the people. So, Doctor, my question to you is, what can be done in the short term? Uh, this, uh, do you want to give a uh, history to this? Uh, are you dealing with the current situation? Uh, solutions, please. Solutions, yes. Yeah. Well, I have seen countries in worse situations than mm. this. That they had certain interesting, important ingredients that allowed them to get out. First of all, they were, these are democracies. I, can, I don't know about uh, other democracies like ours. Of course, that degree varies from country to country. They had a leader who understood the situation. They had a population also that understood what had to be done. And then they got a lot of assistance from neighbors and uh, some international institutions. So I have seen that happening. Uh, it is, it's, it starts with some uh, electing, uh, uh, put it this inappropriate government. Mm. Uh, of course, they are elected. That's the important point that we have to make. So when we sort of point the finger at the government, I ask, hey, how, how did they get there? We voted. So we have, we have to learn that uh, the judgment we make about such an important uh, decision as who is going to govern us in a democracy, then we need a certain amount of maturity from our citizenry and, and understand to learn what has happened in the last administration, look at the current administration and so on. <coughs> So I think that uh, uh, some governments are very good by definition. They, are, they, you know, people talk about Scandinavian countries. There are East A Asian countries also that they have, there are very good governments in developed countries like Japan, United Kingdom. Uh, you find them in uh, Latin America also now after some gyrations and problems in the 70s and 80s. We have, uh, in a way, uh, had <laughs> difficult times, most of the, many occasions. Mm. We, have, uh, uh, we have maintained our democratic uh, uh, situation, if you have democratic uh, dimensions, mm. like we have elections every, uh, we didn't postpone elections except one, except it has been one case. Uh, we have, um, we don't have a very bad uh, human rights record as some other countries. I can name some countries that have that. But we are not in a very good situation today. Most of the thing is actually 
economic and as well you, you mentioned political and if you like social. Uh, so if I talk to the economic, um, the last 20 years we have not been in a good economic situation, we managed, but now we come to, uh, when you have debt, it comes to some uh, situation where we can't go further, right? We are in that situation today. Uh, so we are, we have slow GDP growth, uh, we have very high debt, uh, we are finding, trying to find ways of emerging out of it with help with the IMF and the World Bank. Mm. But we need to do a lot of internal organization and thinking how to get out of this. Actually, it's not, uh, I'm not saying it's easy, but it's well known what to do. Mm. We wind back the things that we have done, the governments have done in the last, say, uh, 10 years, shall we say. Uh, we were not very careful with the money that we got in terms of revenue. The, this government uh, uh, created a huge problem by reducing the VAT rate from 15 to 8 percent. Some 600 uh, uh, million rupees were lost. Then we had this uh, very bad way of uh, suddenly changing over to non-chemical fertilizer without any announcement. Uh, then we have had a highly controlled uh, uh, economy that has got highly controlled compared to the past. For example, we have very high economic uh, uh, import restrictions now. So people who want to increase exports also have to have to do not find the raw materials and the, the technical uh, uh, little even little uh, wages and things that are needed for to to. Uh, continue manufacture. So we have to dial back from those things. Now that is very important because that can be achieved not only by having good economics, but good people who understand the situation and have leaders who can do it. That's my example of countries that I've seen in uh, Latin America, in uh, certain countries like Ethiopia that were really in the dregs and had a great uh, leader uh, who unfortunately died young and they are again back into the same old <laughs> situation that they were there. So we have we need a, four or five elements to work together. Good leaders, good understanding of the situation, uh, public who, uh, which and the, and the politicians, for example members of parliament who understand it, what is happening, who is not, um, who uh, want to learn how the next step of what to do, uh, some consensus to get some action that will get us out of the current situation. I think there is the possibility that we can, if we follow our, our good principles, good uh, uh, advice, uh, I am more that way, not as pessimistic as the normal people uh, today are generally, uh, people are pessimistic saying we can never get about, I told somebody who called me today, uh, uh, daughter of a friend of mine, I said don't say, don't say that because if you say we have no hope then that's, we have no argument after that. Mm. We always have hope, we always have ways of, you see, you as a young person must think what is, what is it that we are going to do now. Mm. We are, you know, we are, Actually, I would say it is not that bad economically. It's not that bad. We could be in a worse situation as we go forward, but we are not that bad. We are still can rescue. Okay, from so the situation. you're hopeful. Thank you, Doctor. Yeah. Um, Bhavani, the 21st Amendment to the Constitution was looked at as almost a panacea to all woes, uh, a chance, of an, an opportunity to sort of redeem uh, the country from, from its uh, dwindling situation. But um, just moments ago, the party leaders who attended today's meeting with the Prime Minister to discuss constitutional am amendments have agreed to implement the 19th Amendment as the 21st Amendment to the Constitution. Further, they also agreed to abolish the executive presidency as a second step on the way forward. How do you see this? I'm not surprised, Sonali. And uh, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, 
Considering what we've seen in the last few weeks, um, a prime minister who joined the government without any conditions when the other opposition parties were very clear in their conditions. One was the abolishing of the executive presidency. And this is something the Bar Association also has called for. But most importantly, it's something the protesters and the citizens have been calling for. So there's a clear demand mm. for a change and a change that includes changing the structures in Sri Lanka, changing the culture. Mm. So for several weeks, people have been on the streets peacefully calling for that change. And that change is not reflected in what the government is now proposing. Right. So the government's bill that has been presented to cabinet and um, seems to be a rather watered down version of even what I had expected it to be, is really providing a lifeline to the president. Mm. It's ensuring that the executive presidency remains. The president can continue to hold ministries. He will continue to have the power to at any point prorogue parliament, mm. dissolve parliament after two and a half years. So it doesn't change much in terms of the present system. Yeah. So the executive presidency may be diminished to some extent, but really is not going to make a huge difference. No. And it's a shame because people have been calling for a system change. And a system change doesn't mean you plaster a few things, you change a few things willy-nilly just because to appease a few, make your own political deals for survival, but really come out of it and people will be like, well, what's the difference? Yeah. So I'm not surprised that they have come to some kind of compromise, but that is not heeding the calls of the people who've been very, very clear in terms of abolishing the executive presidency, great accountability, checks, bringing checks and balances. And we need to be very clear, we are in this crisis because of particularly individuals and because there has been a crisis in governance. Mm -hmm. So if you don't address those things, we're going to continue this fast for a lot longer. So this is an opportunity to change, but unfortunately the politicians don't seem to be realizing that that opportunity uh, is fast diminishing. So it's very, very sad actually what's happened. Mamani, there's this massive disconnect between the, the politicians uh, on the one hand and the people who are protesting and demanding meaningful uh, change. And this gap doesn't seem to be narrowing. Mm. Well, that's the sad thing. You know, you would have thought after 14, I mean, golf is the protest, tomorrow it's 50 days. Yeah. That's quite remarkable. 50 days where mm. people have been peacefully protesting. But the protest started way before. It started in March in, in Kohuel, actually, when people came out, the silent individuals, protests. silent yes. protests. So since March, it's been more than two months of people mm. peacefully protesting. May 9th was an exception where violence was seen, and we'll talk about that. Mm. But for over two months, people have been very clear. Mm. And the demands are, I mean, their demands are go home Gota, go home Rajapaksas. They seem to have achieved at least some of that. System change, abolishing the executive. I mean, there are clear demands. Yeah. Now, if those demands after so long cannot be addressed, mm by the politicians, mm. by the executive arm, but also the legislature, because let's realize this, the legislature also has been sitting while these protests have been continuing, mm. and we haven't seen much movement. We've seen private members' bills being presented, very important, mm. especially the SJB private members' bill. It goes really quite an extent in system change. Yeah. A no-confidence motion against the president. There's been some attempts. But for the people, the question is, you're dragging these processes, but what is the end result? What's the tangible result that they can feel? And after several weeks, they're not seeing that. So I would say the politicians overall are see seemingly not heeding the calls of the people, the calls of the protesters. So I think that that also needs to be looked at. There is a gap. Mm. Um, but I have to also say the protesters, regardless of all the setbacks, 
they have continued peacefully. Absolutely. And that's, that's quite, quite amazing. That needs to be recognized. Doctor, um, in terms of geopolitical realities, uh, Sri Lanka has borrowed several billions from China. Um, there is, n uh, and, and other countries, uh, there is no proper cogent plan in place on how the country is going to generate revenue to finance its day-to-day -day usual expenditure and pay back these loans along with interest rates. How urgently must we draw up this plan? I mean, it's not rocket science, right? Yeah, but you know, um, uh, I don't think there's a formal plan is being prepared. I don't think it's in the works. Uh, people in my profession don't have great respect for plans because plans uh, come and go. But what they're doing now is to introducing a new budget, which is like a six month plan. The earlier one that was prepared earlier was not a budget, but more of a joke, right? So the, this one- The interim is, budget. Yeah. This one is a budget again, six months. Mm. And uh, a bu budget should have a, um, uh, a, a plan for where how the revenue is coming how we are going to, uh, what is the expenditure, and if there is a deficit as we have always, how to repay it, mm. how to pay yeah. it, and, and economic stability, prices and other things depend upon how well the budget is done. So I understand that is being prepared, and uh, so the economic side, I don't know, yeah. Yes. And so if, if they can, and of course the people must agree, it must pass the pass master in parliament, right? Mm. Uh, because if, if uh, I think the constitution is if if a money bill fails, finance, it, yeah, uh, you have to leave, mm. right? Mm. I mm. don't know how far that's going to be implemented, mm. but that there are certain sort of uh, uh, points like that which will make a correction. Mm. Uh, I feel that it is not it, it, we, we are in a very dire, difficult situation. Mm. Nobody can deny that. I mean, you have see, I have never seen in my so many years people in this country in this situation. Mm. Uh, and so if, if the, you want to have some economics element into the situation, then they have to deal with these people who are on the streets, some who are dying, uh, waiting to get oil and waiting to get cooking mm. gas. Mm. They, that has to be addressed before mm. everything. Then we can think about what are the other elements that we have to in, in place in order to get the economy going. We, we have, we have no plan as yet to uh, get the economy going. We have to have the, we, we have to have a, a people predict our GDP growth rate 2.6 and things like that, outsiders. Mm. Uh, so we have to start thinking about uh, dealing with this immediate problem, right? It's politically deadly not to have this for any political group. We have to, uh, appeal to people and say, here, we are going to find you a, a, a package that gets you out of those um, long queues and the real pressure on the poor, poor people. Mm -hmm. And people who do one day wages are in a hopeless situation. Yeah. We have to have a system that we can actually make large cash transfers to people right. as we do it in uh, India under the other system. It can be done. And I talked to the guy who uh, former advisor to the president of India is a class is a friend of mine. Uh, I asked him, did this work? He said, Adha worked very well. Okay. And that's a huge challenge in a country, I mean, millions, I mean, mm. so many times the size of this thing. Uh, people, everybody has an account. They right. had this 12 digit card. Okay. You, you know, it, that we can do it. Actually, it was discussed in the last government uh, that this was proposed, but then the government, you know, last election, but that was being discussed at that time. So as we have to do those things. But I like to see uh, where we are going to, uh, we have to raise revenue in order to pay domestic debt. For, leave aside the foreign debt, we have difficulty with domestic debt. Mm. And some people are even talking about uh, <laughs> printing more money. Uh, and yeah, in so, fact, the Prime Minister speaking to Reuters uh, yeah. said that he will be uh, looking into printing one trillion rupees. Yeah. 
uh, I'm not an enthusiast for money printing, uh, but sometimes if you have no other, it's, but it, I, I have to be convinced that there's no other way of raising money. Right, yeah. so that should be a last resort, not the first yeah, option. Yeah, it's, I, that's a good way of putting it. And uh, because we have, uh, on most things we have burnt our boats, so yeah. it's not easy to find money. Um, and also you have to have some level of, uh, you know, uh, some uh, provision to people to be fed, you know. Mm. People now switching to uh, one meal from three meals. And I think it's even more difficult for people who do day-to-day -day jobs, who, who have, don't have regular, you know, uh, work arrangements, regular employment. Mm. So that's the thing. So uh, as a emergency met measure, I, I think uh, that could be all right, but I'm worried about that. Because what happened was that the inflation that we started, that we see, uh, was started by money printing, basically. Mm. Um, mm. Actually, a better way than creation, money creation. Right. Where everybody prints so legitimately. Mm. Mm. <laughs> but is that when you, big loans are taken, given by the central bank, mm. uh, and, and then that increases pressure on the prices. And so um, uh, that should be the last resort. Uh, actually, there's enough scope for us to rate, uh, raise uh, taxes. The, we have a very warped system, mm. ta tax system. 20% mm. of the people are the ones who pay uh, income taxes and other direct taxes. 80%, including the poor people, are paying indirect taxes. When you buy uh, sugar uh, or dal, uh, yeah, dal yeah. you are paying, everybody. They, so the guy who makes 130,000 rupees a week <laughs> pays the same amount as the poor man who makes, uh, yeah. you mm -hmm. say, 500 rupees a month, yeah, something yeah, like that. Yeah. And so that has been entirely reversed. Mm. But actually, a crisis is also an opportunity. Okay. Uh, is, there's a saying that never waste a crisis. Okay. Is that we can reverse those things now. Okay. We can tell those people, the 20% the, the who uh, benefited from the tax cuts of this government, right. hey, you pay back what you have got. Mm. Uh, why are you keeping to it? So I, I have even had a, a discussion to say, why don't you pay your taxes early? Okay. Pay it one year, I think, every time bring it one year forward. Mm. And actually, you, it's that when you see certain pub, certain private enterprises, not mm. public, <laughs> making a lot of money, mm. you know, okay. they are, they are, their income has gone up. Right. So they can share it, they are in a position to give it. Yeah. Uh, Bhavani, from this question, I'd like to move on t to you. Um, a, l a lot of economically flawed decisions made by a very few at the helm resulted in the crisis being faced today. What of accountability, uh, punishment either by way of criminal or uh, civil penalty uh, for dereliction of duty? So now that's a good question. I mean, in terms of what's even coming out now mm. as to the role of the central bank governor, the yeah. role of the monetary, monetary board, board, I yeah. think the COPE, uh, what has come out yeah. from exactly. just COPE yeah. uh, is very, very worrying in terms yeah. of how decisions were uh, taken. What was the, dis the information and thinking that went into the dec decision making and how they were able to do it? Yeah. That shows also a huge issues in terms of systems. Oh, yeah. so. There's no accountability, there's no oversight mm. or effective oversight yeah, yeah. because they did it for several months. Um, so there's, I think, now slowly information coming out in terms of key actors who are in the then government mm. from civil servants to possibly advisors. Now, one of the things, despite the crisis and some of the information coming out, I would say we need to still follow due process. There has to be a proper thorough investigation. Mm -hmm. You know, we can't make it a personal vendetta and go after individuals. First get that information. And the core process, I think, is quite indicative. Mm -hmm. There are some huge problems 
directly linked to individuals. Right. Now that information, who is going to use? And that's a question we are going to have to keep asking. Sure. Because even during the previous gov government, mm. there are allegations of corruption, mm. some who are now in government or were in government, mm. some of the same faces, but those investigations or prosecutions didn't follow through. Mm. So there's a huge problem in our systems. Mm. So A, first, what are the investigations that can at least lead to indictments and prosecutions? Can those carry through? What are the institutions that can do it? Mm. Now, the Attorney General has broad powers, can do it if they want to do it, the Attorney General's department. There is also the Bribery Commission that also can take action. Yeah. So there are particular institutions we already have in place. Then we also have the parliament, the committees that can look mm. into it. That's a great way of calling officials, asking questions, making that information public. Mm. Now, that's one process. But another that came out through COPE, at least in the media I've seen, is also the role of the People's Bank, for example, uh, providing loans to individuals without no accountability oh, and this yeah. goes into billions. Yes. Now all of this needs to be investigated mm. but also that pressure needs to happen. Mm. We can't in six months time go well that was six months ago we move on. We need to learn from the lessons from the past. This is going to be a long drawn out process. We need to also recognize what is the expertise capacity we already have and ask for assistance because one of the failures from the past is not having the needed expertise, needed capacity to follow through on accountability. Right. So accountability is critical, mm. but accountability also needs to be done properly. It can't be seen as a kangaroo court process yeah, where people yeah. will then use the whole political victimization because we've seen that. So let's not repeat those mistakes. This is an opportunity to get those things right. All right, fantastic. We're going for a short commercial break. We'll be right back. COVID-19 Sadha Arakshita Piyavara Nithara Mahondin Saban Yoda Dad Sodan Saban Ho Visabija Nashika Madhya Sariyak Bavitakara Dad Pirisindu Karan Sama Vitama Annaya Samaga Meetreka Durastha Bavayak Pavatva Gan Haki Sama Vitama Nivasi Randi Sitin Nirathuruvama Nivaradiva Mukavarana Palandin A brand new year, a year of hope, a year of aspirations and people looking for inspiration. Our software engineers, our uh, IT expertise are, I mean, not seconding to anyone. A proper investigation led by the CID, this will be swept under the carpet. Understanding about the stock market, the fundamentals, the economy, that is very important. Entire ownership of this reclaimed land as well as the governance of Port City are all under the government of Sri Lanka. No planet, no people, no business. Yes. And this is the simple thing about Biznomi. Your weekend's most profitable 60 minutes. Biznomi. Saturday and Sunday at 5 p.m. Welcome back. This is the People's Platform. Um, Dr. Raja Patirana, you uh, have extensive experience working um, as a financial expert internationally, but also at the Sri Lanka Central Bank. Yeah. Um, speak to us about the role of the Central Bank in ensuring um, stable monetary policy. Yeah, actually, I'll begin by saying that I work uh, for the central bank or in the central bank for 10 years from 1965 mm. to 75. Okay. It is one of the best institutions that uh, existed in the country at that time. And also when you compare with other central bank, maybe in other countries I worked with, it was a pretty good central bank. Okay. And there are expertise, there are people, they are, they, I mean this is like a very different from governments, government, other government offices, it is because it's independent. One of the reasons why 
it has the central bank is not independent anymore, mm. right? So people can intervene, interfere with it. So I think that we have the framework of the Monetary Law Act. We have to do certain uh, little changes it, with it, it, uh, in it. Uh, not so not so big, little changes in it will get it right. But I am very interested in the appointment of the governor to go through this process. Okay. Because we have two governors, I won't mention their names. One governor was uh, ideologically uh, not uh, ready to, you know, understand, to yield to uh, good economics, although he was a very good e economist himself. Uh, the other governor didn't have that is an accountant and so the, how did this guy people get appointed because it has a crucial role in the economy because what happens to them what is anything bad some of the money happening <laughs> hurts all of us right by sure. the inflation rate and also some believe some totally un untested poor oil ideas like uh, Increasing money supply has no effect on prices. I mean, <laughs> that is like saying <laughs> that's one of the more. Uh, if if uh, one of my students in the first year students would have said, I'd say, this class is not for you. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, this is believed by the governor of the central bank for the modern monetary theory. Mm. It is maybe modern, but it's actually completely disastrous, wrong uh, thing. And even now, somebody Arsha raised the question in the in COP committee about that somebody who believed that there's mm. no real central bank certainly cannot believe say mm. that i mean right so we have to get the uh, there are very good people there even mm. today excellent people and so th there's it re requires i think the appointment is for, to start with the top good appointments and uh, it needs a lot of attention actually to get out of this current place of our problem. Central bank has a crucial role to play that how we are going to uh, get our domestic economy right and also to manage uh, the debt part of it uh, al along with the treasury. So I think there is an agenda to be achieved there. Bhavani, uh, now um, one of the interesting points uh, that I saw in the uh, uh, SJB 21st Amendment uh, proposal was that um, uh, as per the independent institutions, uh, independent commissions uh, uh, should be uh, making appointments also uh, for the uh, governor of the central bank as well as the members of the monetary board. Mm, mm. So this ensures the independence, mm. the non-partisan nature. Mm. How important is it to have members of the monetary board and the governor of the central bank uh, to be independent, non-partisan, to be someone who is objective, who has uh, the country's best interests at heart. So Sonali, I mean the whole point of having independent appointments, mm. going through that process, yeah. this has been something many of us have been saying for years, some yeah. for decades, you know, if you think about going back to the 17th Amendment, to the 19th mm. Amendment, yeah. the fact that you needed checks and balances, that one individual should not be having so much power mm. in terms of appointments to key institutions. And that seemed academic for many because they didn't see the disasters mm. that it could entail. Yeah. Now we're living that disaster. Right, yeah. Now we don't need to talk about a hypothetical situation. Unfortunately, mm. Sri Lanka is in a political and economic crisis that people are now seeing for themselves what an individual with such broad powers has brought upon this country. And these powers were entrusted on him in 2020 by the 20th Amendment. Mm -hmm. And many of us opposed the 20th Amendment. We challenged it in court. Because at least with the 19th Amendment, with even if its failures, there were checks. The Constitution Council had to play a role in terms of appointments to key institutions. 20th Amendment removed it, uh, brought in the Parliamentary Council, which was a rubber stamping mm -hmm. exercise. Mm -hmm. and I mean, the central bank governor didn't even go through that process. It was directly by the executive president. Yeah. So now we're living the disasters of those actions. And this is why it's such a good opportunity. Mm. If I mean, without looking to other countries, we look to our own experience. Mm. We're living that experience and saying, 
we need good individuals in these positions, but we also need individuals who are not going to be partisan, right. who are not going to be loyal to the executive, mm -hmm. who need to go through a process. So this is the time not just for the central bank government and the monetary board, mm -hmm. But also other institutions Absolutely. like right, right to Information Commission, for yeah. example, should also be coming in. Yeah. So that's not in the government's mm. bill, and I think we need to ask those questions. Why are they not bringing in the things that are already in in a proposed bill? Yeah, yeah. This is the opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. My final question to you, uh, uh, Dr. Rajapati Rana. Um, Sri Lanka is at the mercy of the, the, the IMF, the World Bank to get in much needed funding. However, uh, a few days ago the World Bank said, look, if you, if you guys don't have a proper macroeconomic policy framework, we won't be giving you money. Uh, how yeah. must Sri Lanka navigate through this very um, sensitive, tough process of managing, its, um, managing the World Bank and IMF? Uh, actually, I um, worked there for a long time. I also have a lot of connections with the IMF. Uh, whenever I led a mission, I took IMF guy along. It's very easy to work together and uh, get uh, they work together to have that thing all covered. So when you say at the mercy, that bit uh, really, uh, <laughs> uh, I have a question. Whether, when you say mercy, you see, the ideal world, in the ideal world, mm. we don't have, though we don't have to go to the IMF World Bank. If we manage our system well, we don't mm. have to go. Mm. It's like the, go, going to the IMF, it's like going to the emergency ward in hospital, right? Okay. And you are going, when you tried everything and things are, then, they go, then the doctor says, hey, you got to have this. You are not going to, and you, mm. you have no option, very much option, le, 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 low option. Now, these institutions have done this very well. They are, they, are, they made mistakes too, I know. So, uh, so, in a way, they, they, their programs will impose the, impose a, a situation that the, the election of good economic policies mm. that brought us here. Mm have to be sort of in a way dialed back now, mm. for example, they, they'll ask for a, it's a very, I'll make it very simple, yeah. but, but what we are having is that we have had a, a very fast growth in uh, uh, expenditure, which goes into the, into the balance of payments also, in our external accounts also, and that the IMF, IMF's idea would be to say, you have to slow that down and get it in line so that you are dealing with the external account. Mm. World Bank's uh, um, remit is to say you have to help the country to start growing, growing back right. and by uh, having better policies, uh, in increasing productivity and things like that. So together they can work actually. Okay. I have seen that they are doing rescuing many times. It also imposes a discipline on us right. and also if you have a program with the IMF and the World Bank, our creators will be more amenable for us okay. to prepare a program. Yeah. All right, great. Thank you very much. Uh, Bhavani, final question before we go. We have two minutes. Uh, tomorrow is the 50th day of peaceful protests uh, outside the uh, Presidential Secretariat um, near Golf Face. Uh, how do we sustain the protests and how does that translate into actionable um, change, reform in the system? Uh, also, uh, the 9th of May, uh, attacks mm. on the peaceful protesters and its aftermath where investigations have taken a very slow pace. We have seen um, some very strange incidents also mm. speak to us about it before we wrap up tonight's show. So 9th of May was very alarming mm. in terms of the way that violence happened mm. and the fact that now evidence is out there that the mob started from temple trees so mm. then Prime Minister's supporters were very much involved in it. And Attorney General has already said 22 should be arrested if there's evidence. There's only been a handful. So I, I do worry in terms of the accountability despite the mm -hmm. evidence mm -hmm. and despite the fact that people, the witnesses, victims have gone and given complaints. And now we are seeing intimidation coming towards those who are wanting to engage with that process. Very worrying in that sense. But I want to end with the whole thing about this the protests, mm. 50 days at golf is, but started way before. 
and people just coming to the streets. Very, very, I mean, remarkable. Um, and I mean, they've sustained it. They've not wanted any others to come on board and take it on. These, these are individuals who've done it. And I think they will continue till their demand of go home, go ta is met. I think that will continue. But they also need to recognize that it's going to be a hard road ahead. We're not going to get immediate results. Um, and the results that we get, we need to appreciate, we need to enjoy it. But keep the keep attention on the system changes because mm -hmm. Sri Lanka cannot be beholden to individuals. We really need to think about structural change, systems being brought in, mm -hmm. and a culture where citizens are all equal, mm -hmm. citizens hold government to account, and that there is um, that kind of activism which we've seen, but that activism can go way, way beyond this particular moment. So kudos to everyone. I think that excellent what has happened, but so much more to do. All right, great. Um, thank you very much, Bhavani Fonseca, attorney at law, for joining in this discussion. Thank you, Dr. Sarat Rajapatirana. Thank you for watching us, and we'll see you again next Monday with the Singhala edition of the People's Platform. Good night. Thank <laughs> you.